what is up everybody welcome back to our stream i missed you guys since since pre-market prep it's been a long hour without you welcome to a brand new show that we are starting uh right now uh this is called our list maker series and let me first talk about like the reason behind this show and what 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 the point is we spend all day talking about the stock market we talk about stocks we talk about uh crypto we talk about the daily movement up and down uh, there is so much more. We've asked for feedback. We've gotten this feedback. There is so much more to the world of investing than just stocks. There are There's real estate, okay? There's startups. There's collectibles. There are other pl platforms. There are other assets out there that, that demand your attention, frankly. Um, we're in an inflationary environment. The Fed's raising rates. Who knows what that means going forward for the future of the stock market? But there are other asset classes out there that 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 are important and are worth talking about now historically these asset classes were were limited to high net worth investors uh, the rich people but not anymore because there are dozens of companies out there that are actually providing real everyday people access to these alternative asset classes that is the point of this show we are going to highlight the companies that are providing access to asset classes that were traditionally off limits to everyday investors. So we're going to be doing this show once a month, uh, and uh, they're going to have a theme. This this month's show, today's show, is alternative investments. We're talking real estate. We're talking startups. We're talking collectibles. Um, that's the theme of the show. So we've got about 18 or so companies we're going to highlight throughout the next hour, hour and a half, uh, and we're going to tell you a little bit a, a little bit about them, how you can learn more about them, and uh, we'll have some conversations. We're going to talk about real estate. We're going to talk about, um, you know, what makes a good startup deal. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, but we've got uh, a great, um, uh, a great group of companies today to talk about. Before we go uh, any further, uh, first let's thank the uh, the sponsors of today's show: uh, Red Swan, WeFunder, Cadre, Crown Street, and Dealmaker. Without whom this show would not happen. So. Without further ado, I'm going to formally start this show. All right, so let's do this. Let us let me throw it now to our first segment here. I'm going to bring on Luke Jacoby, a.k.a. Hot Stocks Luke, and uh, Benzinga's alt investment guru, Kevin Vandebos. They're going to run through the list, all the companies that are on our alternative investment list today. Uh, and Kevin's going to tell you a little bit about what they all do. So, uh, guys, Kevin, Luke, good morning. What's going on? Good morning, hey. Spencer. Good morning. How, How are you doing today, sir? Doing fantastic. It's good to see you up there. Both of you, you don't usually sit up there. So uh, it's great. It's great to see you both. Um, and uh, yeah, awesome. So yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to say, as Spencer mentioned, I'm Luke over here on the Benzinga team, joined by Kevin Vandenboss, managing editor of our alternative investment content. Uh, and, and before we, we dive into it today, I just want to give a little bit of, of more preview as to this list maker series. But what we're kicking off for 2022 is we want to recognize the companies that are really moving the needle uh, in, in, in investing. How are, we, how are we getting to that next frontier? As Spencer talked about, uh, that we're going to focus on alternative investments today. That's where we're starting off. But, but these companies that, that we're going to recognize today and in coming months are we, we should truly be proud of, right? They, of course, should be proud of the work that they've done and the contributions that they've made. Uh, but, but we, as consumers, as individual investors, I'm an individual investor just like everyone else out there, should be proud of the work that, that these companies are putting in. It's, it's really, really a badge of honor to, to become a list maker. It's, it's not something that we take seriously. So, Kevin... As, as Spencer called it, our alternative investment guru, as I call it, our, our managing editor of alternative investments, uh, you know, get, give us a little bit of a, a preview or maybe a little bit of background for, for those of us out there who don't know what exactly alternative investments means. 
Yeah, absolutely. So alternative investments are, you know, it could be essentially anything that falls outside of your traditional, um, you know, stocks, bonds, ETFs, et cetera. You know, these are typically um, tied to tangible assets. You know, you got real estate, um, artwork, you know, startups, um, you know, and any number of things that, you know, can create value, increase in value. And, you know, these, well, alternative investments are, you know, becoming more mainstream now. I mean, they're, they're not new by any means. You know, these are assets that, um, you know, institutional investors, um, billionaires have been investing in for, um, you know, for generations. But, you know, regulations have kind of limited access to the retail investor. And, and that's changed a lot over the last few years. So, you know, retail investors are now getting access to these same investments. And, you know, we've got, you know, some very innovative companies that are, are helping making that happen here. Okay. And, and let me ask you this, Kevin. Why should I, I as, let's say, I'm the voice of the individual investor today, what, why should I care about alternative investments? And, and I'll tell you my personal story. I'm a stock guy through and through. I'm a, I'm a stock guy. Hit, hit some nice trades this week, one, one on Netflix, one on Spy. Uh, talked about those on our programming. Uh, I do have crypto exposure as well. That was sort of like like my first foray out of stocks and ETFs that I've been investing in for, let's call it the past decade or so. Why should I care about alternative investments? Uh, so, you know, one of the main reasons, I mean, is is diversification, of course. You know, you know alternative assets, you know, are, have very little correlation with the stock market typically. Um, you know, you know, real estate, for instance, you know, the market could be down, uh, but real estate is still producing um, income. You know, it's, it's consistent and its value isn't, you know, affected so much by, you know, the overall uh, market sentiment. Excellent. I, I appreciate that context. And, and so, so with, with, I guess let, let's just hop right into it. Let, let's jump into the list. Let's see our 2022 alternative investment uh, list makers. We're, we're coming to you live from our, our office in Detroit, Michigan. I love this camera angle. Let's check it out. We, we do have an ice rink behind us. It's a little early. It's a little cold, but maybe we'll get some skaters in there before our time is up today. Uh, but again, let's jump into these 2022 list makers. We're going to be looking at companies in four different categories, okay? Uh, Kevin talked about the universe of alternative investments being incredibly broad. We're going to be touching on, on pretty much each of the facets that we've seen major innovation in. The first one is going to be companies that give us access as individual investors uh, to investing in startups, sort of like venture capitalists have, and, and high net worth individuals have been doing for quite a while. The second is we're going to be looking at companies that give us access to real estate deals. Right, I, as an individual, cannot go ahead and buy this building that's in the background right, right here on our screen right now, uh, but, but now I can buy a fraction of it. Third, we're going to be taking a look at collectibles. Uh, you know, this can be cars, wine, art, et cetera. Uh, and then the, the fourth group that we're going to be looking at are retirement solutions, right? Uh, how do I get access to some of these, not just in, in a cash investment account, but actually in a retirement account? And, and, and before we dive into those four categories and reveal the 2022 list makers for you, I want to talk a little bit about, about why this category specifically, this, this, this January uh, list reveal that we're doing is really near and dear to our hearts here at Benzinga. When, when we got Benzinga going, it, it was with the mission to level the playing field for the individual investor. Benzinga was born out of the Great Recession. It's, it's been over, over 10 years now at this point. And, and what we saw happening is there was just a crazy amount of inequality of information between the institutions and the individual investor, right? We, we were getting news about financial instability week, weeks after the institutions already had a front run. And we said, hey, there is a better way to do this. We can really level the playing field, especially in the equity markets for the individual investor. And, and the reason why we're so passionate about this alternative investing space, why we've built an entire team just to cover these alt investments, is because it's a furthering of our mission. These companies are truly making something accessible that none of us had, let's call it 10 years ago, five years ago for a lot of these asset classes. You know, I, I think we're, we're going to talk about Yield Street in a little bit here. I remember going to their office a number of years ago and there was like a, a, a couple people in a WeWork, right? The, this world has moved so quickly, opened up so much access. Uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely incredible. We can diversify. I can get real estate returns. I can collect monthly rent payments out, out of an apartment building that I own a sliver of now. 
that's something cool that's not something I've had before, and that helps me to diversify. But don't worry, I will still be, be making some stock picks, okay? Um, so without further ado, let, let's dive into to our first grouping, 2022 Alternative Investment List Makers. We are going to be looking at the firms that are giving us access to startups. <laughs> All right, all right. Startup category. Can we get the reveal of the first company to be a 2022 list maker? Start Engine. Have it up on the screen here. Kevin, get, give us a little bit of the breakdown on Start Engine. Yeah, so Start Engine is, you know, has become one of the biggest names in the the startup crowdfunding space. So, so Start Engine, you know, allows you know, early stage companies typically, you know, startups of, of all cycles um, onto its platform to raise capital from, you know, retail investors. So, you know, just, you know, the average everyday investor can get on Start Engine, browse companies, and, you know, a lot of investments, you know, are as little as $100 even, um, you know, to invest in these companies. And actually, one, um, you know, one campaign they had on recently, Nightscope, um, is you know had great success and they i think are actually um listing on nasdaq tomorrow so wow. just a you know great testament to the success that you know this platform has had and they've actually been as you can see on the screen here um obviously uh michael jordan rookie card is not a startup so they've been you know kind of broadening into you know other alternative asset classes as well you know collectibles they've got real estate and um, some wine offerings too Yep, and sh shout out to great friend of Benzinga, definitely involved with Start Engine, Kevin O'Leary. Uh, and, and for the crowd out there, I left this note out. Uh, if you have not explored the alternative investment space, stay tuned. You're about to hear 18 different platforms. We have 18 2022 list makers. You're about to hear from all the options out there, or, or at least a, a wide breadth of them. Um, but but with that, let's get to to our second list maker in the startup category. Can we get that on the screen? Republic. All righty, Kevin, can, can you give us a little bit on Republic, please? Yeah, so Republic is, you know, another, um, you know, equity crowdfunding platform, you know, similar to Start Engine, but they have, you know, different, um, kind of a different variety of offerings. You know, they've got a lot of, you know, very innovative companies in the, you know, in the crypto, the blockchain space. Um, you know, they actually just, you know, closed a round of funding for a, um, you know, a, I guess like a metaverse, uh, a real estate fund, actually. So some really cool, interesting stuff they do. Um, you know, they're, you know, definitely, you know, one of the companies that are, you know, are paving the way in the startup investing space. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. All right. So, so, so we're going through the, the firms that give us access as individuals to investing in startups. We take a look at the first two, Start Engine, Republic. Can we get the third company on the screen, please? There we have it. WeFunder. Kevin, t tell us a little bit about WeFunder and what makes WeFunder special. Yeah, so, you know, WeFunder actually, you know, helped pave the way, um, you know, initially for, you know, startup crowdfunding to um, non-accredited investors. Um, they're, th you know, the largest platform out there right now. They have the, you know, the largest number of offerings at any given time. And, you know, they were actually involved, you know, early on in the process with, you know, changes that were made to regulations that, you know, allowed this type of um, access to investment. So, you know, definitely, you know, huge player in the space, um, you know, making it possible for everybody else, um, you know, and just, as like I said, one of the, you know, obviously the biggest, of course. Excellent. And, and, and Kevin, while, while we're going through this startup category, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour. Can you, can you just give us a little bit of information about the types of startups that are common to see on these platforms? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, everything. Um, you know, there are some really, you know, neat companies. You know, like I, I mentioned uh, Nightscope earlier, uh, autonomous security robots, for example. Um, you know, Jet Token is another one um, that may, may still be on Start Engine, you know, a, a private jet company. You know, everything from, you know, large companies that are looking to list, um, 
you know, on a major stock exchange, all the way down to local breweries, distilleries, um, and you know, just you know, so really, really cool stuff to kind of get an idea of what you know what's coming up in in different industries, um, virtual reality, uh, medical devices, um, just. I mean, whatever you can think of, you know, if there's any particular, you know, industry that you really feel has, you know, a lot of potential, you know, these provide some opportunities to find these early companies. Excellent. And, and Kevin, I, I'm going to, but before we dive back into the list, I'm going to ask you one more question. Uh, what, what are some of the rules on investing in these startups? Are there limits that the companies can raise? Are there limits on the amounts that I can invest? Do I need to be an accredited investor in order to invest? Uh, any sort of rules or, or context would be helpful. Yeah, lots of rules, of course. Um, but, you know, those rules depend um, on the type of offering. So, you know, without getting, you know, you're too technical here, you've got three different types of crowdfunding offerings. Um, you know, the, one of the more common ones, you know, in, in recent history has been, you know, Regulation D, which is just for accredited investors. Uh, but more recently, we've seen more uh, regulation CF, you know, regulation crowdfunding, and regulation A, which opens this up to you know the the non-accredited investor and brings down um, the minimum investment. So, you know, depending on the regulation, um, you know, there's different maximum raises. So, for instance, the the regulation CF um, has a five million dollar um, annual maximum for a company, and then you know regulation A has different tiers. Um, and then the accredited investor only ones, um, you know, pretty much unlimited. Excellent. So, all right, I, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this one out to the crowd. Uh, if anybody out there has invested in any of these alternative investments deals, whether, whether it's a startup, we just went through it through the startup, uh, list makers, we're going to be getting into real estate next, then collectibles, et cetera. But if anybody out there has invested in these deals, well, will you throw me a one in the chat? If anybody hasn't invested, but is curious or interested, throw in a two. Uh, and, and I guess if you have any other comments, we always appreciate those too. Uh, I'll speak from my personal experience. Again, I'm a stock guy through and through. That is my passion, the love of my life. Uh, we'll, we'll, we might be, might get a little bit of time out of Spencer to talk some stocks later today. Uh, but I recently made my first two alt investments. Um, so so I'm, I'm just starting to get into it now. And, and if you're just joining us, let me give you a little bit of the lay of the land. This is the Benzinga 2022 List Maker Series. The, this is where we are showing off to all of you out there, here are the companies that you should be paying attention to from an investment standpoint. Uh, today, we're starting with a category near and dear to our hearts, what we think is one of the next major frontiers of investing, alternative investments available for the individual. Uh, we just went through the platforms that are giving us access to startup deals, right? Something that venture capitalists have been doing for a long time now. Next, we are going to be moving into real estate, right? How do I get access to real estate if I want to own this building that's behind my corner right here? I cannot go out and, and raise the $50 million to do that myself, but can I own a slice of it? Now I can. Next, we're going to be moving into collectibles. And then we'll be moving into retirement solutions. And, and shout out to Fourth Wave in the chat. Doesn't know what we're voting on, but two. He agrees. Um, so, all right, Kevin, you, you just took us through the, the first grouping of, of, of our alternative investment list makers. That is the startups. Next, now let's get us kicking over and look at the companies that are giving us access to these real estate deals. And, and Kevin, let, let's start by asking you this. I thought that was some very tranquil intro music. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I feel very, relaxed. Very tranquil. I might just have to get that two-second loop and uh, throw it on, on background to help me sleep tonight. Uh, but all right, Kevin, uh, we're, we're moving into the real estate category. Tell us about Les, Lex Markets. Congratulations to Lex Markets for being the, the first one in the real estate group to become a 2022 Benzinga list maker. This is a badge of honor for all the companies on here. What, what do they do? How, how do they help us as individual investors? Yeah, so Lex Markets is, is one of the newer platforms um, in the space. So, you know, as you know, we've seen in the startups, you know, these, these, those platforms are all um, available to non-accredited investors. You know, real estate's a bit different. Most, um, most crowdfunding platforms for real estate are still accredited investors only. Um, 
you know, especially in the commercial real estate space, but Lex Markets is, is really changing that up. So they're bringing, you know, some of the same types of assets that are only available to accredited investors, to, you know, institutional investors, um, to virtually anybody with, um, you know, low minimum investment. So I think it's $250, get on the platform, you can buy shares in a property. And they even have a secondary market, which is really cool because um, real estate is inherently a an, you know, pretty illiquid investment. It's long term. So if you something comes up, you need to get your, your cash back, very limited options. So, you know, Lex has their the secondary market. So you could actually list your um, shares in a property um, for sale to another investor. Yeah, that's absolutely interesting. All righty. So, so first one that we took a look at on the, the real estate alt side of things, Lex Markets. Can we get the second list maker, please? I see, I, I see pr producer Spencer in the background working on pulling up that second list maker for us. He's typing furiously. It's not Republic. I it's don't Republic, so. actually. Oh. It is. So Republic makes it, it, make twice? it twice. Yeah. What? So, okay, so uh, Republic, if you you recall, we just saw in the startup category. How how is is Republic in the the real estate category as well, Kevin? So yeah, they actually um you know they they moved into the real estate space uh, primarily launching uh, what they called city funds. So you could invest in these specific city funds. One of them I think was Austin, uh, one Miami. So if you liked uh, you know just an overall market, you could invest into this fund that. That diversified across different properties, those markets. Um, as of right now, those funds are all um, are closed. But you know, through that momentum they built with those, they added you know a lot of other uh, real estate offerings to the platform. Some really unique stuff that you're not going to find um, on your typical uh, real estate you know crowdfunding sites. And you know, most of these again are available to non-accredited investors. Some offerings are accredited only. Uh, it just depends on the regulations they're using. All right, so there we have it. Republic making it into a couple categories. 2022 list maker. Uh, and, and again, for anybody who's just joining us right now, we're going through the companies that Benzinga is recognizing is really moving the frontier and in giving individual investors access to real estate deals. We took a look at the first two, Lex Markets, then Republic. Producer Spencer, can we get the third on the board, please? There we have it, Red Swan. Kevin, tell us about Red Swan. So Red Swan is one that you know I think our, our audience should really um, get behind. They are, you know, kind of you know pioneering a really new um, you know space in real estate investments through tokenizing properties. So um, they you know referred to it as, as blockchain real estate, um, you know, digital properties. So. Typically, you buy, um, you know, you're buying securities. You're buying shares of, you know, a company that owns a property. What Red Swan is doing is turning each, you know, asset on their their platform into its own cryptocurrency. Um, you know, there's, you know, a ton of benefits to that. It's not just a gimmick. Um, you know, it kind of it really simplifies the whole fundraising process, and it also adds a liquidity option um, to investors to be able to sell those tokens you know, within the, the target investment period of the, these properties. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, question out of the chat coming to us from David Wilson. Uh, do you know of any of the firms that we've talked about take non U S investors? Um, I, I don't know which ones, uh, specifically. I know a lot of the depends on the regulations. Um, but yeah, some, some on the list they do. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Let's keep moving through this real estate category. Uh, Producer Spencer, can we get the fourth list maker on the board, Arrived Homes? Congratulations to the Arrived Homes team. Kevin, tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, so Arrived Homes is another um, one of the newer you know platforms to the market. And what they actually, they, they go and they acquire you know, really like nice high quality rental properties. And they, you know, securitize them and sell shares to the investors on, on their platform. And this is another one open to non-accredited investors where you can, you know, browse a properties. Um, so you can actually buy shares in a specific rental property right now with a minimum investment of $100. So, I mean, rental properties, um, you know, obviously one of the more popular real estate investments. And so this is just a really easy way for somebody to, you know, either get their feet wet in real estate investing, um, 
or if they are just looking to add this type of asset to their portfolio, uh, Rived Homes is you know, an incredible option. All righty. Let, let, let's keep it clipping through the real estate category. And I want to throw this one out there to the crowd watching us. Uh, we saw a lot of people say they were interested in getting into the alternative investment asset class, or they already are. Uh, what type of deals are you interested in? I'm, I'm curious. Is it startups? Is it real estate deals? Is it collectibles? Something beyond what, what we're thinking about? Let us know in the chat. I'm curious where everyone's at. The first couple deals that I did were real estate deals. We're, we're going through the real estate category. Can we get the fifth list maker up on the board, please? Ground floor. Kevin, tell us about ground floor. So ground floor provides you know a different way to invest in real estate. So you know the platforms we've talked about so far um, are equity. You know ground floor is actually you know they, they got kind of um, almost two different companies. So they make hard money loans to real estate investors and builders who are either you know you know building a home to sell it or you know flipping it. And so what they do, they make these loans and they securitize these loans and put them on their platform for investors to buy shares of individual loans in these properties. And I mean, at only $10, um, you know, $10 minimum investment. Um, you can, they, they add, you know, typically maybe 15 to 20 new loans a week. So there's a lot of room to diversify across different properties. And, and will you tell us really, really quick, Kevin, what a hard money loan is? Yeah, sorry. Um, so a hard money loan, it's kind of, it's a, you know, not a traditional bank loan, right? So these are loans that people are, um, that might not, you know, qualify for a normal mortgage because it's a distressed property. It needs a lot of repair, but it has, um, you know, a lot of after repair value. So it's common for somebody who flips houses to use this type of um, financing short term. So it's a higher interest loan. You know, a lot of these could be, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15%, but they have terms that are going to be six to 18 months. Um, so then they can either sell the property um, to take out their profits or have them refinanced once, you know, they, you know, kind of meet normal uh, you know, lending guidelines. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. So again, for anybody just joining us, we're talking about the companies giving us access to real estate deals. Uh, we are staying in the real estate category. Producer Spencer, can we get the next list maker up on the screen, please? Motive, Kevin, what is Motive doing out there for the individual investor? So Motive um, is actually a REIT. You know, I, I know a lot of people are probably familiar with your typical publicly traded REITs. Um, Motive is a public non-traded REIT. So, you know, they operate the same as, you know, any other um, REIT or, you know, real estate investment trust. Um, they own, I think Motive's got a portfolio of around, you know, $500 million worth of real estate. So investors buy shares in that portfolio, essentially. Um, but the, the big difference is these shares aren't traded on, you know, on a major stock exchange um, right now. So, you know, their price has, you know, more protection, I guess, from, you know, the stock market. If, if things are down, you know, instead That's of... That's interesting this week. I'll give you that much. Right? Yeah. We, we get a little bit of volatility this week. It definitely makes it interesting. Yep. So, yeah, um, it's yeah another way to invest in real estate. Um, they just kind of instead of choosing a property, you're you're kind of you know investing in a whole portfolio. Perfect. All righty, producer Spencer. I know I'm asking you to go fast, man. Uh, but can we get the next company in the real estate category? Crowd Street company that I know very well. Kevin, tell us a little bit about why CrowdStreet is out there helping the individual investor. How are they doing it? Yeah, so CrowdStreet was, um, you know, one of the first real estate uh, crowdfunding platforms out there. And, you know, Luke, you said something about, you know, being able to buy, you know, this building rent or buying a slice of it. CrowdStreet is a platform that you would go to, you know, to buy that type of asset. Um, you know, the deals on here are, you know, are, are, are big deals, you know, that have been, you know, reserved for, you know, typically, you know, hedge funds, uh, private equity firms, um, really big uh, developments um, that, you know, have, you know, opportunities for, um, you know, some outsized returns. Excellent. All right, guys. We are down to the final two list makers in the real estate category. Again, these are the companies that Benzinga is recognizing for pushing, investing for the individual investor, the next frontier. 
We work our butts off every single day to do it in the stock market. We're moving into the REIT space. These are the companies making deals accessible. Uh, if anybody's seen anything that, that jumps out as especially interesting, put it in the chat, like the stream. But let's keep going. Again, this is something you should absolutely care about because we have access we haven't had before. Next one up on the board, we have Acre Trader. Kevin, tell us about Acre Trader. Yeah, so Acre Trader actually allows you to invest in in farmland. Um, you know, they have they've had offerings, um, you know, globally, actually. And interesting, like I, I personally had never really thought about investing in farmland until uh, I watched a, a webinar that uh, Acre Trader put on one of their offerings, and it's one of the, you know, I guess one of the most stable, um, you know, safest real estate, you know, um, you know, asset classes. You know, available, especially as you know, we've got a growing global population. We've got shrinking farmland. You know, the demand for this is really growing, and it's you know been really getting a lot of interest from investors lately. Um, so, yeah, Acre Trader is you know the first to you know bring this you know type of investment. Excellent. I think the the farm move is sort of interesting. Shout out to Kevin Simon in the chat talking about the the Red Swan CRE offerings. Uh, and Richard Calloway saying that we picked a good topic. Spencer Israel specifically did. All righty, everyone. We are down to our last list maker in the real estate category. Don't worry. I'll give you the full rundown afterward. And somebody help me out in the chat when I list all the firms. Drop them in there. We have Cadre. Kevin, tell us what is going on with Cadre. Yeah, so Cadre offers, you know, a couple of ways to invest. So, you know, we talked about, um, you know, buying shares directly into an asset or, getting into, you know, a whole portfolio. So, so Cadre kind of has both these options. You know, they have a managed fund. So if you just want to add real estate to your portfolio, not worry about the property, they have that fund investment. You can also, you know, browse individual deals. Um, but one of the things that, you know, they were the first to do was bring on this secondary market um, for its investors. So they have, I think it's quarterly um, kind of liquidation windows um, or secondary, you know, windows where investors can, you know, put up their, um, you know, interest in these in these properties for sale. All right. And, and, and what is this? I mean, I'm hearing producer Spencer, my ear set. We have one more in the real estate category, one more to recognize. In. And, and again, everyone, I'm going to be running us back down through the list. We're going to talk in just a second here why you should care, why I care as a personal individual investor. But but real Yield Street, uh, Kevin, tell us what Yield Street is doing. So Yield Street is a lot more than real estate. Uh, but I guess we had to, we had to put them somewhere, right? So um, this real estate made the most sense. So Yield Street is you know across the board um, alternative investments. Um, you know, you can invest in portfolios of um, you know consumer debt. They have structured notes, uh, art, um, art equity funds. Um, you know, at one point they even had um, I think an offering where you could buy shares of a portfolio of motorcycle loans. Um, and you know, real estate is of course um, you know a big a big um, chunk of their offerings as well. All different types of asset classes in there. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin, for taking us through it. Again, everyone, if you are just joining us, this is our first list maker event of 2022. This is where we recognize the companies that are really making markets better for all of us. I say us because I'm an individual investor. You are an individual investors. These companies are moving the next frontier. It's a major badge of honors for these companies to make it onto the Benzinga lists. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick recap of where we are and then where we're heading during this segment. So we talked first about the companies giving us access to startup deals. They were Start Engine, Republic, and WeFunder. We then moved into the companies that are giving us access to real estate deals. We had Lex Markets, Republic again, Red Swan, Arrived Homes, Ground Floor, Motive, Crowd Street, Acre Trader, Cadre, and Yield Street. We are down to our last four list makers, guys. And, and why should you care about these? Uh, I'm a stock person personally. I have almost 100% of my assets tied up in stocks. I want to diversify. I want to look for, for other places of outsized returns, maybe places of less liquidity. Uh, so that's why I care. Uh, su suggest everybody explore the category that isn't already in it. Next, we are going to list, we have three list makers in the collectibles category. Okay, Th this is really unique. Uh, so, so why don't we roll straight into the collectibles category? 
All right, we have our tranquil intro music. We're in the collectibles category. Kevin, first list maker we have, rares.io. Tell us about this one. So, yeah, rares is one of the, you know, the more interesting um, alternative investment platforms out there. Um, it was, you know, started by, um, you know, former uh, NFL player um, Jerome Sapp, and where he saw this opportunity to um, give you know, people, the ability to invest in, in sneakers, um, you know, so obviously not just any pair of shoes, you know, these are, um, you know, rare, you know, collectible, um, shoes, one pair that they, they had on there, I think, um, was the, the pair that Kanye West wore to, for, um, um, it was the Grammys. I think it was the 50th, um, you know, Grammys. So wait, was that the one where he interrupted, uh, Taylor Swift? We need we need a rule check know. out of the chat on that one, but all right, that's an interesting one. First one on the list, <laughs> Rares.io. Can we, can we get the second collectibles company, please? Masterworks, tell us, Kevin, about Masterworks. Masterworks, yeah. So this um, this platform lets you invest in um, you know iconic artwork. So we're talking you know Pablo Picasso. Um, cool. Andy Warhol, I mean, multi-million dollar paintings. Uh, so Masterworks, you know, acquires these paintings and, you know, sells shares to um, investors and then also has the, uh, you know, the secondary market as well. Um, so, I mean, these are obviously, you know, they're buying paintings that they see increasing in value over time. You know, they have a, you know, a target hold peri period. Um, once they find the right opportunity to sell the art, they do. Investors get, uh, you know, get to share the profits on that. Excellent. And Kevin, we, we have one more company in the collectibles category. Producer Spencer, can we get that up? VinoVest, what is VinoVest giving us access to that we don't normally have? So, yeah, VinoVest um, gives access to, uh, you know, fine wine. And unlike the other platforms on here where you're buying shares of something, with VinoVest, you're actually getting a, um, you know, portfolio of your own wine. I mean, at any point in an investment, you could take possession of these bottles, drink them. Um, but what they, they provide that, you know, the normal investor doesn't have is, you know, for one, access to, you know, releases of wine that, you know, just, you know, you or I couldn't go and, um, and get. And, you know, the, um, you know, the knowledge of which ones to actually buy, you know, what, you know, what wines are likely to increase in value over the next, you know, three, five, you know, ten years. Excellent. Yeah, the wine play is interesting. The art play is interesting. You know, I like art. I buy some $50 Target art. I'd like to invest in some Picasso art. I haven't yet, but all right, that's interesting. Um, so, all right, I'm going to keep us moving. Again, everybody, we are recognizing our list makers in the alternative investments category. Huge badge of honor for these companies. We should be proud as individuals that we now have access to a lot of these deals. The last group that we are going to move into are the retirement solutions. We have two retirement solutions out there. Let's move into the category and let's get the first retirement solution on the screen. All right. El Tora, tell us about this one, Kevin. That's actually Alto IRA. Oh, oh. not one word. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to get fired. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people don't realize is you can actually add alternative investments to your um, retirement account. So it's not limited to just, you know, stocks, uh, mutual funds, you know, et cetera. Through a self-directed IRA, um, you can invest in you know, a whole range of assets. So um, Alto IRA actually, you know, is, you know, that solution for a self-directed IRA. And they partner with, I think it's over 75 different um the alternative investment platforms, like most of the ones we're, we're talking about today. So you can, you know, kind of get those tax benefits um, through investing through an IRA and, you know, get better diverse, diversification overall to your um, retirement portfolio. And they actually have, um, you know, they have their crypto IRA too. So you can invest it. I don't know what the number is now. It keeps growing, but I think it's over a hundred different um, wow. cryptocurrencies through a it. Lot. All right, Alto IRA, the first one in the retirement category. Last company we have in the retirement category. Last list maker that we have, Rocket Dollar. Kevin, what is Rocket Dollar doing for the individual investor out there? Yeah, so similar to Alto, so they you know provide a way to invest in alternative assets with your IRA. 
but they do it differently. So um, with Alto, you invest through one of their partners. Um, Rocket Dollar actually helps you set up um, like an LLC or a trust for your IRA. So then you can invest in you know any um, eligible uh, alternative assets um, that you co you come across. Excellent. And with that, we have our list makers, our 2022 list makers, alternative investments category, 18 companies on the board. Congratulations. Huge badge of honor for you. And we appreciate the work that you're doing and making markets accessible for us. I see Spencer back up on the screen. What's going on, producer Spencer? We need a company that provides access to stopwatches, and then we need to get you two a stopwatch. That, that, <laughs> that, that's my biggest feedback right now. But Kevin and Luke, thanks a lot for taking us through uh, the list makers. That, uh, yep. the and, and Spencer, investment. I do have two two more segments that I want to oh do Oh, my quick. gosh. You're killing me here, Luke. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have to move on to our keynote speaker of the day. Uh, I'm going to bring on Justin Renfro, the senior director of growth at WeFunder, one of the companies that was on that list we just went through. Went through, excuse me. Uh, and we're going to talk about, uh, you know, why does WeFunder exist? Uh, Reg A, Reg CF. What does that market look like right now? Without further ado, let's bring on Justin Justin Renfro, the uh, senior director of growth at WeFunder. Justin, how we doing, man? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Thanks for bearing with me through that one. Uh, I saw you. I saw you lurking in the background. So let's get right to it. Uh, we, you know, we gave a high level overview of WeFunder and and what you all do, but but maybe we can hear it directly in, in your own words. Why does WeFunder exist? Yeah. So you know, we were founded on the premise that we wanted to democratize access to capital, both for yeah. startups and for investors. Um, for a lot of time, um, investing in startups was siloed. It was exclusive. It was hard to access, um, partly because it was uh, kind of focused on uh, accredited investors were the only ones that could participate. Um, the Jobs Act of 2016 uh, opened up startup in investing for accredited and unaccredited investors. And then, you know, with with WeFunder and Reg CF in general, uh, you know, we're a technology platform that uh, is designed to connect startups and investors. So uh, opening up access, kind of removing geographical barriers and uh, giving investors around the world uh, the ability to invest in startups that they believe in, uh, that they see potential in. Like, what are some, like, can you give me some examples of some of the kind of companies that we're talking about right now? Yeah. So, uh, I would say the the best product market fit and the kind of sweet spot for WeFunder are uh, technology startups uh, that are in the seed to Series A uh, stage uh, that are raising uh, you know capital from angel investors. Our average round is about 500k, uh, but we've got a 50k to five million dollar range in terms of the types of deals that we typically see. Uh, wow. But most of the companies that are uh, fundraising on our platform. Are uh, you know this is this is their second or third round of financing. They've got some traction and they're looking to uh, kind of level up. Uh, you know, go from step two to step three in terms of the the funding life cycle of the business. Um, we're talking about crowdfunding. I would just love to get your thoughts on just the state of crowdfunding right now. It's it's not like a new idea, but. Uh, I have a hunch that a lot's happened in the last couple of years. That, you know, you know, we tend to see great change whenever there is a big disruption, like like the one we got from the pandemic. So I'm just curious, like what what is the market? Or maybe you can give us what is the what did the market look like before COVID, and what does it look like now? How has it changed? Yeah, well, I think the biggest uh, kind of catalyst for change was in the SEC regulations of our industry okay. uh, in March of last year. Uh, there were a couple really big pieces of legislation that just made equity crowdfunding slightly more friendly uh, to companies. Um, primarily, the limit previously was a million dollars, uh, and that was increased to five million dollars. The second big piece of regulation was the way in which these raises showed on the cap table. Uh, so previously, all the investors that came in through a regulation crowdfund would show up on your cap table, which was unattractive to a lot of companies. Now, all those investors are pooled into a, a, an SPV, uh, a special purpose vehicle. So it's one line on the cap table. It's much cleaner. So with the increase of the cap and with the construction of the equity kind of crowdfund raise, uh, 
it attracted a much higher kind of caliber of companies. Better companies are exploring regulation crowdfunding as an option. Um, so uh, a few months ago, we, you know, we, we hosted a, a fundraise for a company, Mercury Bank, that was coming off a $135 million uh, Series B valued at $1.4 billion. And wow. they opened an additional $5 million to the crowd. Uh, and, and that is really exciting for us that unicorns, companies that are valued at a billion dollars plus, are now exploring equity crowdfunding as a viable option, uh, kind of opening up the opportunity for the crowd to participate alongside angels. It's interesting because I wouldn't have a, I wouldn't have thought of a, a bank, you know what I mean? As like you know, a company that would do, that would go to crowdfunding. You know, you think about like startups, like a, I don't know, a technology company, but, but as you said, you said, you said yourself, <laughs> there are more companies on the platform. I, I mean, like, like what else we thought, we, what else we got here? Cause a bank is, seems to me like a, it's highly regulated, but, but it, it was a success. Yeah, well, I mean, the the real benefit for Mercury coming to WeFunder was they could have their customers invest in the company, which is great marketing, great customer engagement, yeah. a huge value proposition for them to be able to offer the opportunity for their customers to to invest in in what they're building and invest alongside, uh, you know, really high quality VCs. Um, when you look at, you know, our, our platform hosts hundreds of raises right now, hundreds of companies that are raising capital, and you see quite an impressive range. You've got real estate, you've got uh, tech companies, you've got energy, you've got nice. sciences. Uh, so it's kind of whatever you're interested in, kind of uh, the beauty is that, you know, you're looking at it through the lens of an investment, but you can look at a very wide range of different types of companies that are offering that opportunity for investors to come in and participate. And like, who are the the investors? Like typically, are we talking you know everyday people, or uh, is there is there a variety here? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've got over a million investors on our platform. It's a global audience, and yeah. uh, you know, you're looking at you know across the entire spectrum. Uh, our average investment is actually eleven hundred dollars, and one of the biggest oh, wow. benefits is the kind of going the going kind of like. Uh, philosophy for angel investors is you're hoping that one of your bets pays off the rest of them. So you're looking for, you know, you're, you're, you're swinging the bat, looking for big exits and big returns. Uh, and, you know, the, the going notion is to make 30 bets and it's like, well, you can make $30,000 bets and one is going to pay off the rest. And it just makes it much more accessible. Whereas, you know, previously it was like a $25,000 floor. Uh, now it's, you know, there's no floor. So it's much more accessible to to the general population to be able to participate in, in angel investing. That, that sort of answers the, the the big question I had, which is like, how, how should I think about these, like an investment here? How should I think about like, uh, you know, buying the stake and taking a bet at one of these companies? I mean, uh, you, you kind of just already answered it, but in relation to, at the stock market, for example, which, you know, you can have a long horizon, you can have a, a one hour horizon or less, right? Uh, on the right. Trade. Like how, how, like, how do you, how do you think about this stuff? Well, I think this, this is not a one hour bet. <laughs> uh, these are, these are five to 10 year horizons typically where, you know, it's like five X in five years. Can this company exit and pr produce a five X return for investors over five years? Uh, that's a good baseline. Uh, but you know, again, if you go to our platform, you've got companies that are raising that are a little earlier that are, you know, five to $10 million valuation on the company. And you've got companies that are raising on a hundred million or in the case yeah. of Mercury, a $1.4 billion valuation. So you can kind of, you can go where you're comfortable on the spectrum. If you want to go earlier where the upside is higher, uh, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a longer and, and, and bigger bet. Uh, or you can go with companies that are further along. Uh, that have uh, you know more traction uh, and and a higher valuation as a result, right? Um, and then are are you finding like people will you know look at an investment is 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 this purely a financial thing or you mentioned the bank that you know they made it so that their customers people who were already involved with the bank could could invest, but uh, is is this just like a, like a financial equation or do you find people? are attracted to companies that 
that they know that they already use? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, every investor kind of looks at it through through their own unique lens. Uh, yeah. You're looking at the team, you're looking at traction, you're looking at the market potential, you're looking at uh, kind of the price. There's right. there's a lot of different lenses by which you can look at any given investment. But I think the you know the the most kind of basic foundation is you're looking at team, you're looking at traction, you're looking at at market as uh, kind of those indicators as to where you should make your bets. Uh, and those are all articulated, um, you know, pretty extensively uh, for any given company on the WeFunder uh, website. Uh, a company will uh, create a campaign page, which has, you know, a short pitch video, a pitch deck, uh, financials, all of the different aspects of, uh, you know, of those kind of core components of uh, of the merits of the investment and 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 kind of, you know, what they've done previously and, you know, why they're raising capital and what they're uh, what they're planning to do, uh, you know, in the future. The prevailing sentiment in the chat seems to be that, uh, is this available to international in, in investors? And you've already clarified that, that that is the case. Yes, that is yeah. the case. Okay. A uh, question from now we know, is there a mandatory hold period? Great question. Now we know. So right now there's no secondary market for, uh, uh, kind of, uh, these types of, these types of investments. So you're really looking for an acquisition, uh, or an IPO, uh, for, uh, for, a, a payout, but, uh, so there's no mandatory hold, but there's, you know, the, these, these are not, uh, super liquid assets. Yeah. That, and I, that also speaks to my next question, ironically, which was like, what what are the risks that that people need to be aware of before they go into this? This is not the same as buying a, a company on the on public markets. This is this is not that. This is the kind of thing that you know angel investors do, but the rest of us don't have the experience for it. So what what what, what risks should, should we be aware of here? Well, the biggest risk is you know you're investing in early stage companies, uh, right. and you know these are these are long these are longer you know longer kind of uh, a longer investment horizon. These are bigger bets, bigger payouts. So uh, you know riskier bets, bigger payouts. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think you should look at it through the lens of you're making a lot of bets. Uh, you know you're 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 investing in a lot of companies, hoping that one. Uh, you know, one takes off, you get a hundred X return and it pays for, you know, a bunch of the, the bets that didn't pay out. So, uh, that's kind of the, the philosophy is just like, don't invest what you can't, you know, in, invest what is, right. you know, reasonable to you. And, right. uh, just know that these are, these are bigger swings. Um, what sort of protection or like regulatory infrastructure is there for, uh, for investors, but also for these companies, uh, you know, again, it's different being a public company and a private company, which these companies are. Yeah, I mean, the SEC and FINRA uh, are, uh, you know, this is a heavily regulated industry. Companies have to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to offer equity to uh, to the crowd. Uh, there is a very robust due diligence process, as well as a, a kind of like, uh, there's a lot of boxes you have to check to be able to do this. So uh, okay. I, I feel that there's there's decent protections in terms of, you know, it has to be a legitimate company that has, you know, that has the the core foundation of a real company uh, to be able to participate and offer equities in this way. So I can't just get like Spencer Co on WeFunder. There are actually there are there are hoops to jump through. It depends. Maybe Spencer Co is super legit, but it's not, yeah, you're it's probably not, right. <laughs> yeah, it's not legit. I made it up just now. Uh, so okay. Right. Right. Um, so, so like there are regulatory hoops, but then there are also like we funder hoops, right? You, you won't Correct. with anybody. Well, investor protections are important. We want to make sure right. that we're, we're offering uh, legitimate investment opportunities to the crowd. And so every company goes through a pretty robust process in, 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 uh, listing on, on we funder. I'm curious, you know, when you have conversations like the one we're having, or when you talk to people, uh, that may not even know that this this kind of thing is available. What, what is the, the big, the biggest thing that you typically hear the biggest, uh, um, whether it's a, a question or a piece of feedback or a concern or, or, or what is, what is the most common refrain you get when, when you talk about, you know, startup investing for, for everybody? Well, I think, you know, again, the, the, these are early, these are early stage companies. So, uh, the due diligence and kind of what you look for in any given investment, uh, it's a, it's a slightly different lens. Uh, I think that, um, 
you know, the, the beauty of uh, startup investing is you're, you're really close to the, you know, to the action. Uh, a lot of our investors are reaching out to the founder. There's a dialogue with the founder. You're like in the weeds of kind of like the startup journey. And I think that's a very exciting and fun uh, piece of the equation where it's like, hey, there's a lot of these dynamics that you can uh, that you can evaluate. And there's an open opportunity to have dialogue with these founders to uh, to kind of, you know, be be a part of the action and be a part of the uh, of the kind right. of exploration of that early stage will these companies will they do like raises in like you know like campaigns or is it like an ongoing thing or does it depend on the company yeah it depends on the company a lot of companies are really successful utilizing this method of fundraising so they'll continue to you know circle back and continue okay. to fundraise i talk to a lot of founders that are like man if i can raise the capital i need from the crowd i'd prefer the crowd over vcs and angels that a lot of times especially in middle america if you're if you're off the coast uh you know those ecosystems aren't super friendly and angels and vcs are um uh, uh, pr predatory might be the wrong word but i think that uh the 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 crowd is a little bit more friend you know more founder friendly in in the sense that uh you know you're not you're not giving up a board seat and you're having a little bit more kind of like engagement from a larger community. I think it's a really unique way uh, for companies to fundraise. One of the reasons I'm really bullish this is because we've seen this in the, in the last year, frankly, with the stock market, with stocks like AMC and GameStop, where the stock to a lot of people became more than just the stock. It was it meant more to them. It was not just letters, letters in their account or not. Exactly. Or, uh, it, it was more to them. And, right. and, and, and these companies can be more to you than just a name in on your in your account somewhere right uh and, and 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 that that like psychology lends itself more frankly to to angel investing than it does to the public markets that's exactly right and yeah. and it, you know i kind of touched on this earlier where it's more up close and personal where you're part of the action you can see the startup journey it's yeah. it's it's more personal uh and a, and, a, and a richer experience in my opinion uh, to to kind of be along that 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 founder journey and and kind of see what it what's what's happening in the moment in terms of you know building these startups. I think it's a very fun experience and you know a big part of it is you know looking at it through an investment lens. What's going to you know what what do you think has the best opportunity to you know have an exit? But I also think there's a philosophical element where it's like what do you care about? What are you passionate about? What in, what do you want to see in right. the world? What are you right. what are you interested in? Uh, there's there's more kind of connection there. Uh, is there anything that we didn't cover, Justin Renfro, Senior Director of Growth at WeFunder? Is there anything that we missed that 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 you want to you want to hit on before we go? Any questions? No, from the I chat? Think, yeah, I think you know, I I, I joined. Uh, you know, I I really enjoyed the programming. Uh, you know, before I joined, and we were talking about all these different assets. I think the best yeah. part of WeFunder is the range of different types of companies. You've got early stage, you've got late stage, you've got all different industries, you've got all the, you know, all these unique kind of rich stories. So I think it's a very uh, cool experience to go and like poke around and research and see what, what are all the different types of companies? What are they doing? How are they framing it? What is, you know, kind of that storytelling and that connection to the narrative is very rich and, and, and has a lot of range. I think that's, that's that's probably my best takeaway. Justin Renfro is the Senior Director of Growth at WeFunder, joining us today for uh, our keynote uh, as part of this ListMaker uh, series show. So, Justin, thank you for hanging out with us. I know you woke up early. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks and for uh, me. very much, look, I, I will be taking some time out of my weekend and uh, doing some browsing. Doing some browsing. I, I appreciate that. Thank you again for having me. All right. Thank, thanks a lot, Justin. Hey, go ahead and uh, if you could be so kind and smash that like button, I'd appreciate that. You know, it can't be a show on Benzinga if Spencer doesn't gravel for likes. That's like that's like par for the course, right? You know, hit the like button, hit subscribe, you know, do do all those do all those things that you do. Um, in case I, I didn't make it clear, if you have any questions at all in the chat, please, please don't hesitate to ask. We do this. I mean, it's fun for me. But that's not why we do it. If we, if it was, if that was the only reason, then we would do all, all the crazy stuff. We do it because it's it's educational, and this is like, like this is serious. Like I, I take this very seriously, right? I mentioned this off the top. Just inflation, 
right, is a thing. Rising rates are a thing. There are other assets out there that demand your attention. Please take this seriously. It's fun, but I mean, come on. Let's take it. Let's, this is important stuff. And we can have fun, but it really is important. It really is important. All right. So we're running way behind schedule. So I apologize to all of our guests. Uh, let's do this. I, I, I may decide to call an audible here. Um, our next segment is going to be um, uh, an explain like I'm five segment uh, with <laughs> with Crowd Street. Uh, I have uh, Ian Far, uh, Farmigle from Crowd Street here. I also have Chris Pachinger from crowd street uh I, this, is, this is gonna be a, a quick segment we're gonna just answer some basic questions about the structure of the real estate market um ian are are, are you good for me to bring you on right now can you give me a, a thumbs up you're good excellent all right let, let, let's do a, let's do our first explain like i'm five segment of the day <laughs> hey look at that <laughs> Ian, Ian, did I get your last name right, Farmigle? You did. Yeah, yeah, Farmigle. It, it used to end in an I, now it ends in an E, so it's a little bit hard to pronounce. Well, there was a lot of debate last night. We found multiple pronunciations online, so we were debating, is it, is it, is it, is it far? <laughs> anyway, I don't want to get into that. Okay, Ian, um, explain to us briefly uh, the, the structure of the, re of the real estate market. Like We got commercial, we got, we got residential. There's some, a lot of great resources on, on the CrowdStreet site, but just – overall here can you, can you explain this point like we're five yeah spencer happy to so well first of all the, the the first part of this answer is like the real estate market is huge and it's structured in like tons of different ways so i'll just kind of talk about our you know small corner of it yeah. in that you know we focus on our marketplace in in the private markets in predominantly equities so this is kind of like a imagine like a massively scaled up version of you and your friends deciding to go buy a piece of property together and partner on what you're going to do with that, right? That could be as simple as like, hey, it's me and three of my friends. We're going to go buy a, a rental house together and we're going to rent it. We're going to fix it up. We're going to sell it someday. But in our case, we're doing that with, you know, multifamily projects, industrial business parks, hotels, retail shopping centers. And instead of, you know, 500,000 or 800,000 for a house, we're doing that at 50 to $150 million for a major commission per piece of commercial real estate. The difference between what I just described and kind of partnering with your friends and what we also do is that you're investing passively with operators and developers around the country who do this every day as their business, have been doing it for years and you know, they might have a billion dollar portfolio. So they're making that investment available to you as an individual investor. Like a lot of stuff that you're talking about today, this is all about democratizing access to private investments. And we're just doing it through, you know, real estate, private equities. And so uh, like you, you sort of already said it there, but uh, can you go through it again? We're talking apartments, we're talking hotels. Like you, what is the commercial side of the, the commercial real estate side of this it, yeah what are, what are all the things that includes so right now kind of give or take about half of everything we do is going to be in the residential space be it a, a a multifamily you know so an apartment complex that's located in a city doing one in charlotte for example could be in dallas could just, you know it's going to be probably in a in a relatively major metro uh that's going to be two or three hundred units it's going to be we could we could be building it we could be buying it and fixing it up so it can take multiple forms. So that's probably about half of everything going on out there. Some sort of residential project it could also be student housing. You know, we built us we're, we're in a student housing development at Clemson University right now. Uh, and then from there, it can get into forms of different, you know, commercial other, you know, we can talk about office deals. Yeah. They can be suburban. They can be downtown. We were we've been in a lot of grocery anchored shopping centers around the country. Uh, and then, and then hotels, you know, a good example, we were, we invested with a, a group called Buccini Poland group in the Virgin Nashville hotel, like in Nashville. So right on music row. Uh, so we were in that project as well. So, you know, it takes a lot of different forms, um, but it's all equity at the end of the day. And, and as the investor, I, I'm getting my return from the rent, right? Yeah. You're, yeah. You're getting your return in two forms. The first is that net cash flow from the property, right? So they're going to, they're going to buy it or build it. And then they're going to lease it up, if whether it's already leased or they're going to, you know, stabilize it. Then it's going to produce, you know, the goal is, hey, that's going to produce cash flow after we pay debt. The net cash flow that's left over after all of that 
is then eligible to be distributed to the partners because that's what you are. You're a limited partner, right? You're not the, the developer, they're the general partner, right? So they're kind of like, hey, I'm the captain of the ship. We're gonna drive it, you know, but you're, you're, on, you're on board. And so the investors get to participate in that, that net cash flow coming out of the project. And if we look across the entire marketplace right now, our portfolio, that leverage yield right now is about five and a half percent across everything, including development to stabilize. The other part of the of the return is essentially when they sell the project, right? They're going to hopefully build it for a dollar and sell it for a dollar fifty down the road. When they sell it and then they make a profit, that's when the investors will will probably see about half or more of the total return. Awesome. Um, any basic questions from the chat, please. There's no question too stupid to ask. Uh, here's one, Ian, and, and, and maybe we can wrap it up with this. Um, how does real estate typically, as an investment, typically behave in an inflationary slash a rising rate environment? Good question. Uh, data over the last, you know, if you look across the, the previous inflationary periods, and particularly if you go to that decade of the 70s to early 80s, when we're in a massive inflationary period, the answer is real estate typically outperforms. Uh, you can see that that the, the private real estate and public real estate in the forms of REITs, they outperform the S&P over that period. There's groups out there like Green Street who've done some good studies and research who showed the, kind of those returns. Uh, but the answer is, you know, net real returns that have beat the S&P over previous inflationary periods. There we go. Uh, Ian, uh, I'm going to uh, move you backstage for one second, and I'm going to bring you back on. So right. stay tuned. Uh, don't don't go anywhere or do, but just come back in like 30 seconds. Uh, let, let's move on to like the thing I I, I am very excited for uh, coming up right now is this panel. Okay, we we're going to bring Ian back. Uh, we we've we've got executives from three different real estate uh, investment companies, and uh, they all do a little bit the attack the space on their own way. We're going to talk to them at a high level. What the heck is going on right now in real estate? Like you, you you've seen the headlines. Housing market is, is, is mooning, it, it, you know, uh, down payment are ridiculously unaffordable right now. Speaking from experience, rates are going up. What does that mean for the real estate um, uh, sector as an investment uh, or, or as a, home buyer maybe um so let me bring on kevin vandeboss who again is sort of our like alt investment slash real estate guru uh is is kevin here i think he's here kevin don't leave me kevin are you here yeah i'm here hey i'm here what's I'm not up, gonna man? leave anybody who calls me a guru behind don't worry hey i pretty good all right uh so so kevin uh we just heard from ian we're, we're gonna bring him back on uh here right now but tell us who else we have on this panel then i'm, I'm gonna let you run with it all right, definitely. Thank you. Um, you know, first I, I want to say, you know, real estate it is and always has been my my favorite asset class. So I'm you know super pumped to be, you know, here to have this the chance to talk to this panel today. Um, you know, first we have Ed uh, and Wonkity. He's the founder and CEO of Red Swan. Uh, we're bringing back um, Ian uh, Formigli, again the CIO of Crowd Street, and we also have David Vincent who is the investment product specialist at Cadre. Welcome guys, and thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna kick this off and, you know, just ask, I wanna get you guys' take on, you know, what has been the, the biggest, you know, theme um, in real estate, you know, in the real estate market the past two years? Kevin, where do you wanna start? Yeah. Who, oh, you wanna sorry. Go um, more? yeah, go ahead, Ian. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, well, th pleasure to be on the, the panel with the other participants. Uh, OK, so if you want to talk about theme, I think one theme that kind of transcends across all, a bunch of different property types is that what we've seen is what we call this cap rate compression. You know, for those who aren't familiar with commercial industry as, as much, what we do is we say cap rate, we take the net operating income, uh, we divide it by the value of the asset, whether it's the purchase price or the appraisal value, and that gets you your, your cap rate. So we used to see these these yields. I mean, that's what it is. It's an unlevered yield on the asset. You know, they used to look like five and six percent in previous years. Now they look like three and a half, uh, and particularly for industrial and multifamily. So that's been one major theme. Uh, before I pass it to the others, I, but I want to point out. I think to me, there's there's a couple of huge stories that have been in the commercial real estate industry over the last couple of years. Have been 
I, we just haven't seen stuff like this before. And it all was pandemic driven. One was the hospitality industry. I mean, got level in, in April of, of 2020, right? We've just never seen assets go from 90% occupied in a downtown city to essentially zero, absolutely empty within a matter of a month. So that created a whole bunch of stuff in the hospitality industry in terms of you know, how they're gonna approach the industry coming back. Um, so it's been super fascinating to watch. And then I think the other thing is, you know, look at the office market. Again, pandemic driven, still in the phases of figuring it out, but you know, office is gonna look a lot different in the years going forward. It's still in that transition phase, but it's fascinating to watch how office is gonna kind of retool itself I do think you're going to see a lot more people back in the office in the next couple of years, but I think it's going to look different than it looked, you know, pre-pandemic. Hey, thank you. Uh, you know, David, what are you seeing? Um, you know, what, what have you see, found to be the theme? Yeah, well, I'd say, certainly agree with everything that Ian just said. And, you know, to maybe put a, a brighter spin on things, you know, uh, some important themes that we've been paying attention to here at Cadre that I think are pretty uh, relevant to the market right now, especially driving that cap rate compression is, you know, greater mobility. And it's a theme that I think was going on before the pandemic and has really just been hyper accelerated over the past you know, 18 to 24 months is people moving out of big cities and wanting to move into smaller cities where you have a better quality of life. And it's challenging because if you wanna live in Denver, if you wanted to live in you know, Austin and move out of New York City, you gotta find a job, right? So it's a chicken and the egg. And more and more what we've been seeing is also companies are moving our headquarters or opening up remote offices in a lot of these more secondary type cities. And so as people are moving there, the jobs are following the people. As the jobs are moving in, more people are attracted. And so you're seeing tremendous growth opportunity in a lot of cities across the country. I mean, places like Tampa, Charlotte, Nashville, Austin, certainly. And we're seeing every day, it feels like more and more companies are announcing big job moves in, into these cities. And that's been a big driver on the real estate side for you know, multifamily apartments, you know, well-located, high-quality assets. There's a ton of demand, and that's a good thing for investors, right? Uh, and it's also impacting the office market, right? So in some of these markets, you're seeing new companies coming in. They're either building new offices or they're renovating existing offices. And you know, to Ian's point, it's really fascinating to watch because we don't know what the office world is going to look like a year from now. And we're still figuring it out. And that, that is exciting. Um, and then the other really big trend that I think has had an impact in the market over the past two years has been the, uh, the continued move towards e-commerce. As retail has suffered a lot of pain over the years, and something that a lot of people have talked about, if you've ever been to a mall in the past two years, you've seen you know, the empty storefronts, more and more people are buying online. We already knew that. But Thanks to the pandemic, everyone quarantining, you had to buy everything online, whether it was your groceries or everything that you used to go to the store for. And more and more companies have offerings just like Amazon, whether it's you know Target, you know all of these other uh, e-commerce companies now. And so you have to have a lot of warehouse distribution, logistics centers. And what's fascinating is that there's a tremendous demand all over the country for a lot of these industrial properties. And so from a real estate investment perspective, you could look at office, you could look at hotel and see some of the pain and the challenging headwinds that have taken place there over the past two years. But there's a lot of you know really positive and attractive opportunity in other parts of the market right now. And that's what gets us really excited. Awesome. It sounds like, I mean, this is creating a lot of opportunities. Um, I mean, which is really exciting to see all these changes. Um, you know, Ed, you know, what are you seeing? Um, you know, what's Red Swan? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for bringing me on. Um, I agree with Ian and David. I think that uh, you see a lot of activity based on really one factor we think is, is value add. That's been a consistent theme for the past not only two years, but five years. And that's where investors are actually looking for opportunities where they can, you know, grow that yield on the, on the asset. I mean, buying an asset that actually has no no rent growth and no upside opportunity has been challenging. But especially with cap rate compression, trying to find an asset that you can actually grow grow your revenue with and grow rents, uh, that's been, I think, the theme that most of us have been looking at. And as what Ian said with regards to the mobility, I think that that's also helping for rent growth. And rent growth has been really the target for most investors, especially in the multifamily area. So you're looking at uh, investors who are buying real estate in areas where they can actually grow the rents in some cases 15 20 percent 
And that has a lot to do with that mobility factor that was talked about. They're looking for areas where they can, you know, make some improvements, you know, increase the look and appeal and the amenities of the apartment building or office building and generate much higher rents, which will actually drive you know, the type of returns they're looking for on, a, on an annual basis. Okay. Um, you know, you, you talked about, you know, you're talking about the value add, um, you know, and increasing the rents. I mean, what's, you know, what is the biggest factor in, in doing that? Um, you know, I mean, how are these investors, developers, um, you know, getting more value out of these properties? Well, they're, they're scouring the markets and really looking at competitive markets, looking at competitive properties to see, you know, if you're looking for the kind of the ugly duckling in a certain marketplace that has higher rents. So like a B value property that might be 80s or 90s construction in an area where you see a lot of new construction growing. There are, you know, 2021, 2022 type product. And so when you're seeing rents at that, you know, class A level, and now you can buy a B asset that may have 50% less value that gives a lot of opportunity where you can improve the amenities of that asset and then bring your rents even maybe 50 percent of where the total market rents are for class a and that creates significant yield uh, down the road so that's really the the objective is to buy a project buy low make some value to it uh, increase rent and then sell at a higher exit point gotcha okay thank you um you know ian i want to you know go back to you and so inflation has obviously been, you know, a huge topic, um, you know, recently, you know, how is that affecting, um, you know, multifamily in, in commercial real estate right now? So we think about inflation and multifamily. Uh, I think there's two kind of distinct things that are going on. I'll start first on the development side and then talk about also about the acquisition side, talk a little bit about what Ed was referring to in terms of value add. So on the development side, what you've seen is just massive spikes in construction costs. You know, I think, you know, if we think about these themes over the last two years, every time that we talk to a developer, it's really about where are you in terms of solving to certainty of your construction cost. You can look at lumber as a good example, you know, because we, we can look at the index of where this stuff is trading. You know, lumber pre-pandemic was $350 per thousand board foot. Board feet, you know, that spiked up over sixteen hundred dollars per thousand board feet, you know, after, you know, in, during the pandemic period. We saw it come all the way back down to three hundred and eighty, I think, dollars per thousand board feet. And then now it's back up over a thousand, you know, hit it's it kind of hit as high as twelve hundred again. And so what that really tells you is that we're on this kind of roller coaster of costs. You roll it all up and construction costs have been up probably well, twelve percent kind of consistent year over year for the last couple of years. So that means that just the, the, the price of building something today is just a lot more than it was in the past. Uh, so developers are trying to navigate that, which is why you probably haven't seen quite as much of the multifamily product deliver as you might have thought you would a few years ago, uh, just because some deals have kind of been stopped or penciled or they're they're kind of figuring out their costs. And as they do, they got to kind of go back and figure out their whole their whole development project. So first, just massive spikes in construction costs on the on the acquisition side. All that cost increase is also, is, as Edward was referring to, is translating into big increases in, in, in rents. Uh, you know, one metric that we look at in terms of kind of these value add deals is when you have a market that has moved, as Ed, Ed was talking, talking about, you find that kind of ugly duckling in the market that now looks really good. You have, a, you have an older asset that could probably live a lot nicer if you could improve it. One metric that we've, re, we've seen reemerge is what we call this, it's this 20% return on cost of the unit term. And so real, real simple example, you buy an apartment complex. If you spend $10,000 in that unit, you replace some of the kitchen, the countertop and the sink and the fixtures, you put new flooring in and carpet, paint it, light fixtures throughout it, right? You spend $10,000 making that apartment look nice, a lot nicer than it did before. Can you get basically bottom line about $170 to $175 more per month in rent for that? Um, you can do that again today. And we, we used to see that kind of return as possible in 2015, 2016. It kind of started to trend down into more of the lower teens as the, as the cycle aged. Now with this massive rent growth that we've seen, that 20% return on cost is now achievable. The other thing you can do is you can back into like, well, am I improving the value of the asset? And the answer is yes, and substantially. If you were to take kind of a current cap rate on a multifamily project, improve that with spend ten thousand dollars improve that unit get that 175 dollars worth of, of additional revenue kind of all drops to the bottom line so you get that net operating income pop you probably just increase the value of that particular unit 40 to fifty thousand dollars kind of depending upon where it is and what it looks like so 
that's the way to kind of earn your way to a return right now in the value add space. So, and it's really being done on the backs of all this rent growth that we've seen kind of transitioning to the, to the inflation. So that's kind of what we see in the multifamily market on both sides. Okay. Um, you know, that, I think that kind of answers, um, you know, some of my next questions, I, I, you know, I want to hear from each of you, um, you know, and how, you know, how real estate is a hedge um, against inflation. I mean, it, you know, you always, you see it touted as that in, um, you know, so I'd like to hear uh, from each of you on, you know, what, what it is that makes real estate you know, a hedge. Um, Ed, go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to touch back on the last comment of inflation, because that's very, very critical of where we're now in real estate, because you know, many people have been buying commercial real estate and paying very high prices, especially in the multifamily, because it's kind of the darling of the industry. Uh, but, you know, they were assuming that interest rates would continue to go down. And people have been very successful because interest rates have been compressing over the past five, six years. And therefore, everyone looks like winners. But now that inflation is starting to hit and you're seeing interest rates climbing, you know, it could be a problematic for people who bought something at a three cap and did not lock in their interest rate on their debt. And debt being a very substantial part of the actual cost of capital, uh, they could have problems if now that debt is floating up to five, six percent and, you know, their cost uh, of buying the asset is three percent. And that value add doesn't work. So that's a dangerous point. But in terms of a hedge, I think real estate uh, is a commodity that's a limited asset, it's a limited asset, durable asset, uh, that's limited value. So you can always kind of raise your rents uh, because demand is going to always kind of help uh, keep the stable stability of the value in one place. So I think that those who are buying uh, real estate at the, with a positive leverage, meaning they're buying with a, a interest rate that is uh, lower uh, than the purchase price, uh, I think they're going to definitely have a hedge against inflation because as people are now moving into units and paying a higher amount of rents, you're actually you know, keeping pace with the cost of capital. So uh, those are the two inflation uh, situations I think are, are key to pay attention to. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, David, you know, let's hear from you. What, um, you know, what reasons do you have that you know, real estate is a, a good hedge against infl inflation? Sure. Yeah. You know, and ju just to, you know, follow up uh, again on the, the value add comments, you know, what I think is interesting also is that in addition to doing those improvements on units and making a property, uh, you know, better uh, through value add, uh, you know, work, there's other things also, you know, you have the, the mark to market rent increases. If you're buying an older asset that maybe wasn't professionally or institutionally owned, the owner maybe didn't know what market rents were. So there's there's rental improvement that you can do there, but also the other side of the balance sheet, right, is reducing the cost of operating a building through institutionalizing, professionalizing those services, reducing the cost on one side, increasing the income on the other side can have a very powerful impact on the ultimately the overall value of that asset. Um, and when you think about inflation, you know, we've touched on some of the aspects here already, right? So uh, the rising cost, if lumber's going up, you would expect maybe less construction, right? So less new construction, limit supply. So the existing assets in that market, you would expect to go up in value if demand is staying the same or increasing, which is certainly what we're seeing in a lot of markets right now. High demand, limited uh, new supply, it's going to push up valuations. And when you are seeing new construction, really high growth markets where maybe uh, you know, rent growth is really strong and is in line with the additional costs of the new construction, those new buildings that are being built, they're commanding, they need to command uh, very high rents in many cases to cover the cost, the higher cost of the construction. And what that does is it also allows other properties, especially the you know buildings built in the past few years, to also increase their rents as well. So it increases the, you know, by limiting supply, you're increasing the value of the existing inventory, but you can also see additional increases through new supply that's coming online, as long as you're in a market that's not really being overbuilt. But in the aggregate across real estate, different asset classes or sectors within real estate have different mechanisms that I think really can help hedge against inflation. You know, with multifamily, certainly rising rents can help you a, a lot there. Hotels, if you have a hotel, you can actually change your rates on a daily basis in real time based on changing costs of managing that business. 
Um, you know, when you have offices or industrial uh, properties where you have longer term contracts, you might be able to pass through rising costs onto those tenants and those properties as well, or have uh, escalation clauses built in. So year over year, you actually have a two to 3% increase in the rent baked into the contracts over time that also help hedge against inflation. So I'd say there's a number of components that are very real across real estate that help either mitigate the cost impact you know, rising costs or increase your income and the value of properties through inflationary periods. And just one other thing to touch on, as you know, Ed was talking about uh, the value of debt and how important that is in the capital stack for most real estate transactions. If you own real estate today and you own it with uh, long term fixed debt, that actually feels a little bit more like an asset if interest rates start to rise. If inflation is rising and those same dollars will buy you less in the future, you're paying back that debt over time with money that is worth less in the future as inflation is rising. So there's a whole number of, I think, very real, tangible ways where real estate operators and owners and investors don't have to do fancy you know, derivatives trades or hedging things. It's baked into just the, you know, the DNA, if you will, of how real estate typically operates in this country that really can you know, help you protect against inflation and perform well. And, and just one final point, and I think Ian touched on this a bit, is there have been numerous studies, and we did a, a pretty deep dive into both rising interest rate environments as well as rising inflation environments here at Cadre uh, using our data science team. And we found, actually, that real estate performs quite well in higher inflationary periods. It has historically performed well. And, you know, I, I don't know that the future is going to be the same as the past, but it gives us some reason to be hopeful that you have the rational story of why it can perform well. And you've seen historically it has actually. And even in rising in, uh, interest rate periods, we've seen that uh, historically uh, real estate has actually performed quite well in those rising or higher interest rate environments. So I think across the board, there's a lot to be hopeful for. If you don't have assets uh, you know, allocated to real estate today, it's not too late. If you're worried about rising interest rates, or you're worried about rising inflation, I think it's a great time to be looking at the asset class. All right, thank you. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Um, you know, I wish, I wish we could, uh, you know, sit here all day and talk. I got a whole long list of questions I'd love to ask you guys. Um, but hopefully, we have you guys back soon. Um, thank you so much. Um, again, we've got Crowd Street, uh, Cadre, and Red Swan. Um, if anybody's interested in getting into real estate, definitely go check out these platforms. Um, some really exciting offerings they've got. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I want to add that the links to all those companies are in the description uh, of this video. So check that out. Kevin, real fast, before I let you go, we're up against the clock. Question from the chat. Do any of those companies, to your knowledge, specialize in warehousing? Do you know? Um, you know I think all of them you know, have some warehousing from time to time. I know uh, CrowdStreet has recently had some developments. Okay. Um, so I think you just got to watch the offerings and you know, you'll see some opportunities. Right. Kevin Vandenboss is our real estate guru. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Great stuff. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to move it along to our last segment here of the day. We're going to do uh, another explain like I'm five segment. Mostly just because I want an excuse to play that fun graphic again. All right. Reg A, Reg D, Reg CF. Alphabet soup. What what does that even mean? If you have no idea, if you're as confused as I am, don't worry. Aaron Shafton is here. He's the head of marketing at DealMaker. He can explain this stuff to us like we're five. Aaron, what's up, man? Spencer, how's it going? I, I got all these letters in my head and I don't know what any of them mean. So uh, let's start with that. Uh, reggae. We'll explain that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think we can zoom way, way out. If, oh, if even five, better. The more zoomed out, the better. If you're really five years old, we <laughs> yeah, can go yeah. way out. You know, if you pull someone off the street, if I step outside right yeah. now and pull someone off the street, yeah. and I ask them to explain buying a stock, nine times out of ten, they're going to describe the process of, like, opening a brokerage app on their phone or a bank. They're you know, going to yeah. go to a stock exchange. They're going to buy IBM or something like that. Um, and that's, you know, buying a public stock, right? It's listed on a stock exchange. Um, there are, of course, other ways to invest money, right? Like there are companies not on the stock exchange who are raising money all the time. They have investors. Um, 
and typically, like I, I'm not a lawyer, and if a lawyer is listening to this description, they're going to cringe a little bit. But if you're gonna if you're gonna offer securities privately and you're gonna invest privately in securities, you need to do so under an exemption, right? Because not everyone can invest privately in something. Typically, if you're not a big institution, the only way you get access to private investments is if you're really high net worth. You're what's called an accredited investor. You you make a certain amount of money or you have a certain amount of assets. And it's a lot, like less than 10% or depending on where you look, less than 5% of people in the US are accredited. So there's this giant pool of you know investors. They want to invest in great companies before all the rich people have had the chance to. And you know there are companies trying to raise money and they're missing 90, 95% of the market. Um, so Reg A is a pretty unique kind of mechanism. It's uh, Reg A itself is pretty old. But in 2015, the Jobs Act kind of supercharged it. That's why people call it Reg A+. Um, and it lets companies raise money from the crowd. So it unlocks two things. It lets everyday people invest. You don't need to be accredited anymore to participate in this private transaction. Um, and it also lets the company solicit or advertise. So you're increasing the accessibility of your offering with two levers. You can tell more people about it and more people can come in. Got it. So, And that was like the first exemption right the, the reg a exemption you said that's been around for a while so the the exemption that most people think of in like a traditional it's called a private placement of securities is regulation d um particularly okay. reg d 506 b if i want to get into it a lot Whoa, too much man. Well, too, too many much. letters i know <laughs> too many that, letters <laughs> that's what lets you know i've got a company i'm trying to raise money i go after a number of high net worth investors that, that's kind of traditional. Reg A has been around um, for a while before yeah. the JOBS Act. I think you were capped at maybe $5 million in the amount of money that you can raise. So going through the hassle of filing all the paperwork wasn't, wasn't really worthwhile. Um, they bumped it up to 50 as of 2015. And then in 2021, it went even higher to 75 for Got a tier it. two offering. Got so now you, now you can really get some juice going. Got it. So And then Reg CF, the different exemption. Right, the same idea. Yeah, it's like the the smaller, you know, it's the reggae light of exemption. So a little bit easier to get going. There's a little bit less paperwork you've got to go through. Um, yeah. Originally, you could only raise up to just over $1 million. Um, they bumped that in 2021 as well to $5 million. Um, so depending on the type of company you are, you know, to the investor, it's a similar experience. There's some more bells and whistles in the reg sure. cf process but you know sure. depending on the type of company you are how much money you need you might go down either path and then when you when you and i were talking before you made the the, the comparison well you made a couple of comparisons one of them was like the this the the store the versus the shopping mall yeah. can you just repeat what that comparison was I'm, I'm sure i butchered it in some way shape or form but what no, and, I, and, and, and and this gets at sort of where a company like 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 yours right like like deal maker sort of fits fits in Right. Yeah. I mean, I, Spencer, I think you're hard on yourself. I don't think you, you butchered it at all. Um, nice. You know, Reg A, Reg CF is new, but it's not brand new anymore. Right. People have been raising money like this for a couple of years now. Um, and predominantly the approach to raising that money has been to put, you know, your offering, your deal um, on a marketplace. Right. And we've heard from we've heard some of the marketplaces mentioned today, you know, and that's that's an it's an approach that works for a lot of companies. Um, but as the space has grown, what we've seen is more and more sophisticated issuers start raising money um, from the crowd. So, you know, 2015, 2017, going to an audience of strangers on the Internet was maybe something you did if you couldn't get the VC money or you couldn't get the private equity fund. Now it's something that even major brands are deciding to do instead of going the traditional route. And when they do that, you know, Chanel doesn't sell on Amazon right? There's a place in e-commerce for a marketplace where you're shared with other brands, but there's also a place for, you know, a Shopify store or a main street retail location where you own the process. Um, and that's what our technology does. We let, you know, the sophisticated issuers who want to go raise serious money and have a serious brand already uh, raise money directly from that brand. They don't need a new community. They need to convert their existing community and they need tech to do that. Um, why, as a, if I was a company, a Spencer Co, right, why would I want to do, to go through this process? Any of them, the reg A, reg D, reg CF, like aside from raise money, I could raise money lots of ways. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, depending on the fundamentals of Spencer Co. and mm -hmm. your outlook on the world. It's shaky at best, but <laughs> you know, I, I've never done the the roadshow thing. I've never gone and yeah. raised VC money, but I listen to a lot of founders who do. And yeah, you know, when you raise capital like in equity financing, you are very literally giving up control of your yep. business. You know what I mean? You're, and I think when you talk to some founders, you know, flying up and down for months, taking up all their time, playing Pokemon Go for term sheets, like, you know, you lose control over that process. Wait, you what was that last part? You're, you're chasing after term sheets everywhere. <laughs> and, you're running around and, you, and, and you you lose control over the process. Yeah. And I think if you want to, if you have the, the asset on hand of an active community or a really great brand that you're already advertising outwards or a product or a service that really resonates with people, and you think you can mobilize what you're already doing in the market to raise money, why wouldn't you turn that into capital? Now, when you spend a marketing dollar, it's working twice as hard. It's marketing your business. It's also acquiring investors for you. Um, that's really attractive to a lot of issuers. And you get you know, a lot of like more transactional benefits. You own the term sheet now. You're mm -hmm. dictating the terms. You get 12 months to raise your capital. It's... Uh, a more involved and kind of community focused way to raise money. Awesome. Aaron Chaston, uh, deal maker explaining to us, you know, the basics, the fundies, the fundamentals of reg a reg CF reg D Aaron, uh, we'll get you back on again. Thanks for coming on, uh, our very first list maker show. Uh, there's, this is, but a, a, a step into an entire universe of, 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 uh, of companies and investment opportunities. And, uh, uh, as I said earlier on the show, I, I, I'm, I'm bullish uh, for a lot of reasons. One of them uh, being the fact that hey, there's more to life than just stocks. And uh, companies like yours are making life easier for individual small investors like me. Uh, so so thank you, Aaron. And uh, thanks for explaining this to us like we are five. Thanks, Spencer. All right. Uh, hey, here's what I got to do. I got to wrap up. Before I do, I have to thank our sponsors for today's show, one of which was not was is are is cadre okay uh we had david vincent uh just just now on our panel uh let me just play this quick video for you from cadre Check it out, Cadre. Again, link is in the description. All right, we got to go, and here's why we got to go. Benzinga Live I should have gone live already. Big guest on the show today, right now. Uh, if you're a racing fan, you're going to like this one. We're talking to Bill Sandbrook. You, you won't know who that is if you're a racing fan. But you will know the name Andretti, yeah? As in, like, Mario. As in Michael. Michael Andretti. Right, his son Michael Andretti will be uh, is I think on Benzing Alive right now. We got to end this show and redirect to that show. Uh, what kind of company are they? Are they looking to buy? Oh, we'll find out. Any racing questions about about anything about racing? Uh, uh, drop it in the chat for for Michael Andretti on Benzing Alive right now. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to end this show. We are looking for feedback. As I said off the top, this is our very first list maker show. We're going to do one of these a month on a different theme um let, let me just tease the future shows okay i'm not going to give anything away but we're, we're doing a show on nfts we're doing a show on etfs we're doing a show on cannabis we're doing a show on um spacs we're doing a show on evs we're doing a show on nil nil name image and likeness ways to Get exposure to that if you're a college sports fan. So a lot to come. The next one of these shows will be the end of February. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks to all of our sponsors today. Let's thank them all for supporting uh, Benzinga, Red Swan. We fund our Kodra, Crowd Street, and Deal Maker. Without them, we cannot have done this show. All right, I got to go. Michael Andretti is on Benzinga Live. That means I got to end this stream so we can redirect you to that. 
everyone have a great rest of your day and uh go watch Benzinga live. <laughs>